Hello, guys, and welcome to Yelling at Clouds with me, Alex Whiteley, and my big brained friend from California, Mr. Eric Fluger. How are you, sir? I'm fine, but I'm not from California. Neither do I sound like Morgan Freeman. Did I say California again? Oh, my God. It's a reoccurring segment on the show. I'm in Florida. And do you know why that is? It's because I was just chatting with, uh, with David Raby again. Oh, cool. Here, i got to shake the Freeman out of me. <laughs> I'm going to have to end up doing another voice this episode and a whole lot of that. Why are you doing a voice like that, Eric? I don't understand. Oh, well, for one thing, why do I look like this? I'm not oh, happy no. to look like this, do I? No. Oh, big burger. Well, why don't we have a little burger? I'm going to end it in three to one. We're going to have a quick change of scenery. Three, two, one, and boff. Like, I can see my face. You see my face? And Eric's got a little flappy burger instead of a big burger there now. Look at that. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. We figured you didn't need to just be staring at this still image I paint once a week and then just have that burn into your monitor for an hour. No, let's give a little movement, a little variety. Let's try this. Yeah. But I'm not happy I... because I look like a burger. And you wouldn't be happy either if you suddenly were made to look like two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. A number five plane. You know when people would they order a, a, a meal at a place like McDonald's or Burger King and they're like, no onions, no sauce, no cheese, just give me the burger and the bun. You're thinking, why? Why? Why do you exist? Like, you know? Why are you going to be an asshole, man? Just get yeah, your what? food. How dare you be lactose intolerant? How can you not have cheese? It just makes sense. Yeah, really? <laughs> but look at me. Don't I look like a dope? I look like a scrubbing bubble. You look delightful, I, Eric. I think you I look, look more like, delightful. I look like Terrence and or Philip from South Park. Hey, Betty. <laughs> I look like one of the mushrooms the Mario Brothers kick around. Yeah. I am so, not loving it. Oh, gosh. Um, but we are here for, uh, for a purpose today. We're here to, to, to drop some knowledge on these guys, right? Right. I'm going to be a little petulant about it while I'm doing it, clearly. I'm a brat burger. It's like, fine, I'll be delicious, whatever. Uh, now, I've got to explain, guys. Uh, sometimes um, I will come across something in the universe that my good friend, Mr. Eric Fluger here, has also come across, and we, like, bam! We just, we just, cl we, we get excited about these things, and we're like, oh, that's got to go in the show. And one of these things recently was uh, from a night where I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish what's left in my, my bottle of rum. I'm going to put on a couple of movies. <laughs> I'm going to stay up to about three o'clock in the morning watching movies. And it was a really good night. I think you should definitely invest in yourself that way it's, uh, every now and again. Um, anyway, so I found a beautiful movie called The Founder on Amazon uh, starring Michael Keaton. And it, it was literally, I had no idea what it was about. It was a case of this movie's got five stars. It's on, on Amazon. It's got Michael Keaton in it. Where can you go wrong with that? It's got five stars. It's got Michael Keaton. So I threw it on. And that's the lucky draw, I guess. That's what you do sometimes, and it paid off because it was the, the film was fantastic. It sure where did, was. Where where does this movie come into your life, Eric? When did you see this? I saw it one time prior, and I'm like, this is pretty good. And then you mentioned that you had seen it, and you, there are times where you don't want to be the presider over a classical form uh, lecture hall series about a James Joyce and stuff like that, uh, where you can make uh, the listeners just yawn uh, their fucking brains out. Sometimes you just want to go freeform, Jack. Cage. <laughs> right. <That's> brilliant. <laughs> Sorry, William F. Buckley showed up. Oh, I thought it was, was Nicolas Cage. <laughs> <laughs> I got to work on something like him if we ever do something of his. I, I can't think of anything of his we do. But then I didn't uh, plan to do this either. You just struck a chord and I said, you know what? Why not? Because I live in a world where, let's say the name, McDonald's has just basically been an institution in my life. So why not watch a film about the man who... Perhaps third in line behind the original McDonald's brothers themselves made that name an institution. And of course that comes to that comes to blows in this film we're watching, The Founder with Michael Keaton in it, which 
actually seems to be an ironic title, doesn't it? Yes, of course. Is he the founder? And in the same sense that the, the Three Musketeers is actually a story about the fourth one. Sometimes you just, you get a little tricky with your titles. <laughs> and so yeah. why not talk about this film? Why not talk about the institution and the fact that this is part of the detritus of my life and that I should hold it up to scrutiny as surely as any other? Mm -hmm. And if I happen to look delicious while doing it and start making the audience start to go, man, I, that, that sounds good. Guilty as charged. <laughs> I do like it. I, lo I love how you've like got this, this great jawline. You look like Joe from Family Guy. <laughs> oh my god, I'm a burger. I'm a burger. <laughs> Connie. <laughs> I'm a burger and I'm fucking pissed about it. <laughs> um Michael Keaton. Um very well respected actor. Um I do reckon he's ever made anything that's bad. I mean I've I feel like most of the films he's been in is, that I've seen of is good. I mean, Batman, great, of course. Um there was um What's the one where it was the there was he was obviously the vulture and then latest uh, one of the latest star uh, Spider Man films, um, and I saw him in um, oh what's it called where he played the uh, gosh, are we thinking Birdman? Birdman, there we go. Because films like Birdman and this really should put the kibosh to criticism about Keaton. Mm. Keep in mind you. you I am old enough to have recalled the casting announcement for Michael Keaton as Batman in 1989 film. And there was actually a great deal of concern that he couldn't hack Batman. And frankly, all those people can goddamn shut up. And I think that films like this are, are proof of that. So too is Birdman. Hmm. Uh, this man is able to deliver a, fantastically intense performance. He don't, I got to do it like him. He's doing a fantastically intense performance. <laughs> but that's what I mean, right? We got we got Bruce Wayne, like, you know, <laughs> we got this real suave guy. Hey, I'm Bruce Wayne. And then you've got this guy, you know, why not buy a five-spool milkshake generator when you can, <laughs> you know, it's just... <laughs> but what <laughs> links the two, what links Bruce Wayne slash Batman with Ray Kroc with his character in Birdman? Uh, an intensity that is buried, but slightly and is not necessarily always frightening, but also quirky. And yet in, and yet he manages to make it frightening when it needs to be and quirky in this film, when it needs to be, he's both. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, sure. Of course he could play Batman. I mean, and now you notice that if there ever, there's an announcement or even a hint of an announcement that he might be involved somehow. In, as Batman in any capacity whatsoever, people jump for joy. That whole controversy that I was around to see is nothing whatsoever now. It's gone. I think I think it's because, um, you know, people have changed the way they think about things now. You know, back in the day, it was kind of like, no, man, th uh, Superman, uh, Batman's got to be some guy in his 30s in his prime uh, with, a, with a body that he can, looks like it's been chiseled out of marble. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter if he can act or not. Uh, where, where you know that was like the 80s that was kind of the 90s that was the action movie era whereas now people are like well why can't bruce wayne be in the 50s or 60s really angry at the world and looking for the new next generation of batman you know what i mean like why can't that be a thing well because uh, it hints that we're way too married to the dark knight returns comics the uh, that the uh, all of this comes from and Perhaps we may need to get back, uh, get away from that to a degree. But here's the fact that he is at this age and at this level in his career where he is this celebrated and correctly so. If he ever does come back to say, do Batman Beyond as old Bruce Wayne or whatever incarnation of the character they choose to put him in, uh, he could deliver something sublime now. If he, he, signed up, he signed up for the Flashpoint movie. He signed up I, for the I, Flash movie. That's what I understood, yeah. Mm. Whether that'll that's come Bruce to... Bruce Wayne, though, not as Batman. Bruce Wayne, so we'll see. We'll see is what he... happens there. Is he going to sound like this when he does it? No, you've, <laughs> no, you've got to put on the Bat Cape, and you've got to go to this marvelous restaurant. 
Uh, Bruce, do I have to wear the uh, the pants, the the underwear, or can I just wear trousers? No, Robin, you need to wear the pants. You need to wear the underwear. Uh, you need to have standards <laughs> at your restaurant. You always have to have two pickles on every bun. Uh huh. All right. Let's let's break this movie down from the beginning. Then, what have we got here, Eric? What are we looking at? Uh, what we're looking at is Godfather with a side order of fries. Think about it. I'm applauding you. That's a uh, poetic. Poet, right. poetry. Here's what we've got here. If you really want me to say, if we're going to go back to Joyce for a moment and go back to the lecture, um, this is definitely a piece of static art, even though there's aspects of it that make you attracted in the sense that you clearly want the burgers you're being made to look at for two hours. And yet, and there's also uh, a version based kinetic art aspects to it in the sense that you're not you're being told that you shouldn't like this person despite the fact that you've been made to sympathize with this person for an hour prior mm-hmm. to that at the end of the day this is a tragedy in the sense of a michael corleone style tragedy when he wins he loses because okay he's situationally won but he is ethically and morally lost yeah yeah I see that, but because he wasn't that guy at the beginning, he wasn't that guy. He was he. I, I mean, I, I'm I'm torn between no, he was that bumbling idiot, and no, that is all an act. It was kind of like he was he was a predator waiting to find the right prey. It's something perhaps more human than that. It's good to play on those levels, yes, but. I perhaps understand Ray Kroc in a certain sense. Here's a man in his early 50s, and I... <clears throat> more than moi. I ate too many burgers. <clears throat> <laughs> He's a man who has, at most, a moderate level of success. But there is something in him that is not able to accept that. That is not enough for him. And he is frustrated. At this stage in his life, he has tried too hard for too long, been disappointed too many times. That is a backstory which the film at least sort of paints in broad strokes in the back of our minds for us as he's trumping from place to place going, I have these milkshake mixers. Mm -hmm. Small wonder that the moment he finds out that there is one restaurant out of God knows how many he schleps around to that buys not one mixer at a time begrudgingly, not only six, according to the first order he's told about, but they're like, no, better make that eight. Well, what the hell? I got to take a look at this. What the hell else am I going to do? The man is frustrated beyond belief. And as his wife, Laura Dern, and we will get to her, correctly points out, he is frustrated and his frustration bleeds over into every other aspect of his life and he's toxic. He's not necessarily a predator dressed as a clown. He's a desperate man that is willing to pull other people off the plank of wood so that he can stay alive rather than drown. Yeah. And I think, I think, what do you think of the brothers, the McDonald brothers, when he meets them? Do you, do, do you think oh, it's it's payday or does he think I could work with these guys? With That's these horrible. guys? Well, Adorable. Uh, first of all, just to put a pin on the on how Ray Kroc is at the beginning of this. That's why I think I chose the name Nothing Burger for this episode because, for all intents and purposes, despite the moderate ex- success that he enjoys but can't enjoy, he is essentially that a nothing, a non-entity, a nothing burger, as we understand the term in its general usage today. He wants to be more than that. He wants to be somebody. The funny thing about that is that the brothers he runs into, at least one of them, also wants to be a somebody, but a limited somebody. He has a ceiling for his somebodiness that Ray Kroc doesn't have. So now let's get to the brothers. You asked me what do I think of them. For one thing, they're adorable. The casting was perfect. I think so. And it was, it was weird to see Nick Offerman in a vulnerable situation. Well, not vulnerable because he was kind of like, no, these fries are off by 2.5% or whatever it is, you know. Um, but 
like when when we see him in Parks and Rec, he's very much that kind of like, hmm, you know, he, he's the alpha male in that, and you get used to seeing him like that. So when you get to see him as, I got like an autistic spectrum kind of vibe off him where everything has to be perfect and timed perfect and mm. I work with a lot of autistic people and i see that trait in him uh, but it, it was definitely like it was very vulnerable because he was he was naive about a few things right on the spectrum myself i must say i'm not quite prepared to get on board with that ju- at this point mm. clearly more study is needed i'm coming into this frankly I feel like somebody, I feel like the experience I had when I saw the X-Men movie, God knows how long ago it was, the <laughs> first one, in the days before Jackman was Jackman. And I came into that not having read barely any of the X-Men comics, if at all, not having any investment in this. And, and therefore, I was judging X-Men, the movie, on its own merits only. And I'm kind of doing the same with this. I'm judging the film on its merits only as a piece of static art about a tragic uh, character that succeeds into darkness. But at the same time, I haven't read or had the time to read any of the material this was based off of. And clearly it begs for that kind of research. Mm. For one thing, the story itself is fascinating. And, and second of all, as I will get to from the hi, from the little research I had, um, this isn't 100% accurate to history. It is still art first, but we'll get to that. I, if we're going to talk about the brothers, I think uh, this is the perfect time for the quickie speech I have prepared. <laughs> you and I have talked about, oh, for one thing, Nick Offerman is wonderful in this. John Carroll Lynch is wonderful in this. Uh, uh, he's a bear in his other work, yes. And then he's coming into this as a more subtle form of bear. But he is his normal bear self when he comes out and he's like, I'm busy being a French fry scientist. <laughs> this, is, this isn't cooked right. John Taffer. Yeah. I want you to have that name in the back of your head because I'm going to make certain the association sticks in a moment. And then here we have John Carroll Lynch, who is also a big ass scary bear and other things too. He he was in he was in uh, Zodiac Fincher's film as the alleged killer, and the man is fantastic at playing scary. But here he is probably. Pers- portraying somebody who's a lot more like who he is as a person in real life than the Zodiac freaking killer. Uh, It's a perfect pairing. Uh, Now let's get to Dick McDonald because, and the association I make with John Taffer, because before Ray Kroc ever enters these people's orbits or knows who they are, They have gone through quite a tale, haven't they? And this film tells it to you. They appear to be motivated not by any great mission to be burger geniuses at first. They mean only to survive in an economic landscape which you and I cannot conceive of or wrap our heads of. I can't. No. We may yet live to see a kind of repetition of that. I don't know. Only the gods know, and those in charge. Well, we if, came close with the um, uh, what you call it, the uh, the worldwide the, crime. the pandemic. Uh, literally, no, no, shot our, Oh, no, go ahead. Two thousand and eight. Oh yeah, that the, too. The recession. There you go. That's the word. Suffice it to say, the economic landscape that formed the McDonald's brothers is different than ours. Yes, of course. Yeah. But here's what we can understand and relate to. No matter what happens to these people, they seem to be prepared, A, to roll with a punch, and B, to do so creatively. They can't do this, they'll do that. They can't open a theater, they fine. They'll open a, a restaurant. If they can't make that work because drive-ins are now all the rage, fine, they'd like it a drive-in. If they can't make that work in one town, they'll move it over to another town. If they can't get it through the bridge, they'll cut it in half and get it under the bridge. <laughs> There's a certain fluidity that allows them to survive in a kind of Darwinist sense that I very loosely and probably very irresponsibly use and probably perhaps shouldn't, but we get what that means, right? 
if it is dog eat dog and rat eat rat, and I don't know if it should be that way or if it is, but if it is, these people are able to survive in that. They can keep their heads above water in that. And then that not being sufficient for them, this is where I bring John Taffer into it because they seem to have done a bar rescue on themselves. Think about mm-hmm. it. They make all of the calculations a bar rescue episode makes on a given episode. I mean, you've watched those. You love those. Yeah. And yeah. Do you see what they're what they're doing? And it relates to that. Okay, what do we need to streamline? Okay, our uh, statistics and demographics. Okay, these these sort of people are buying our food. Uh, these are the sort of foods that sell: just burgers, shakes, fries, this, that. Let's slim. Let's streamline. We don't need uh, girls to bring food to your car. You we come don't need that. plates. We don't cutlery. need plates or cutlery. We'll just use paper. They do all of that and. They do it on a level far greater and perhaps far more worthy of any bar rescue episode than you and I might could see. But isn't mm. that well, the first thing that comes to your mind? Yeah, it is. It's one of those one of those things where I mean, they kind of been the first pair of people to think about that. I mean, if they were, then the people of that generation were so stubborn, so stubborn across the across the board. Oh no, no, we definitely need plates. Uh, well, how are we going to eat them? You, you, you need you need a. Uh, he knives and forks, and we definitely need some pretty girl with roller roller skates to take the food out. You know, uh, so <laughs> do you know what I mean? These these guys are the first people to make this groundbreaking movement where they can be like, "We want food that's super fast, thirty seconds, and we you're going to eat out of a bag." You know, and 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 to have worked out systems that is the most important thing I want to emphasize. A good bar rescue episode will tell you about the importance of systems, and systems. usually has John Taffer come in and quickly graft systems onto a place. In the space of perhaps three days, four days, God knows, they worked it out over themselves over months while their restaurant was shut down on a tennis court. (laughs) And the film shows you that according to what little I've been able to research in the time I had, that is accurate, that, that they did that. And they worked it out all by themselves. They didn't have a genius with experience like what they needed to go to to provide for them, they literally developed it themselves. Now, let's talk about where I, as an artist, suddenly go <gasps> very important. about this. <laughs> very important. Because even bef- before Ray Kroc comes into the picture, not only have they v- developed the speedy system that is vital to what catches Ray Kroc's interest, they have gone to the trouble of organizing a new look for themselves already. They have gone to the trouble. Well, the, the film mentions that before Ray Kroc said, yeah, franchise this right from, they tried it once. Uh, and that one of the restaurants they tried it at, they said, you know what? We need to completely uh, do an entirely new building. And let me I'll go from that. Oh, please. I've got, pictures, I've got pictures of the old building. So this is the original building. Uh, okay, yeah. That's the one so. we start with, with Speedy, which is the name of the character named after their system. They dispense with that not long after, and I'll go into why. So next. Boom. Yeah, one, yeah. The story of those arches right there need to be gone into so i hope you don't mind me indulging myself by doing so oh please do um i have to i'm an artist this is what strikes me and in order to do this on the quick i've had to basically defer to wikipedia i'll do that now and then in april 1952 it says they decided they needed an entirely new building to achieve two goals, they have to further the efficiency in which like, they put in stone all of these improvements and systems they were working out. And they needed a more eye-catching appearance to generate a call to action, as, as John Taffer likes to put it. To make a guy that is walking down the street, otherwise not intending to stop, and then stop. Eye-catching. In other words, aesthetic arrest. But a kinetic form of that that is meant to first hold you and then draw you in and then go, I wanted that. Every voice I'm doing is now Michael Keaton's voice. (laughs) I want that 
whatever's in there. So what they do is they they go to an architect by the name of Stanley Clark Meston. They actually go to several architects, from what I understand. Four architects they interview. This is basically what's done. I am so not a stranger to this as an architectural renderer that I just know this story, and it's easy to tell it. They go to four architects all together. Uh, they... And uh, they came to the architects with these arches. Dick McDonald is the one who came up with the arches himself. And he brought this sketch of those arches to all these architects. Whatever the architects said about the idea kind of determined the choice during the interview. The first architect they interviewed says they objected the arches. He wasn't picked. He wasn't picked. The second wanted to change them. He wasn't picked. The third one, a prominent L.A. architect named Douglas Honnold, said if the brothers were going to tell him what to do, they'd be better off doing it themselves. He wasn't picked. The person who says yes to the arches is Stanley Clark Meston, an architect practicing in Fontana. They, they pick him in 1952. He says yes to the arches, and he works them into the design with some help by a guy named Fish. Um. Let me make certain I can get his first. Charles Fish. I want to make sure credit is where credit's due. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about the design itself. It's It does exactly what you want. It's It gets noticed because, as the Wikipedia article is clearly saying to me, gleaming surfaces of red and white ceramic tile, stainless steel, brightly colored sheet metal, and glass – pulsing red, white, yellow, and green neon, and then these big-ass two 25-foot yellow sheet metal arches. I'll bring the picture up again for you guys. Please. Oh, there you go. Look at that. That's what we see. Now, this, I am told, is an example of what we like to call googie architecture. <laughs> googie. Googie. Googie, googie, uh, googie. I like that. <laughs> it's good. Why is it called Googie Googie Googie? Just I'll, I'll I'll read it quick, just so that people don't think I'm a nut, nutball or more of a nutball than I am. The na the term Googie comes from the now defunct Googie's Coffee Shop in Hollywood, designed by John Lautner. And uh, I'm not looking at an art. I'm, I can't see a picture of what the Googie's Coffee Shop looks like right off <laughs> here, but it. Suffice to say, yeah, this fits in with that. It's that sort of architecture that everybody knows without having to be told. And I've described the features, you know. And think of, I want you to think of something. This is what floors me. All of these things, these modern age things that we are considering as institutions, as simply the background radiation of our lives was developed by one of these two brothers in relative obscurity. And uh, what clearly developed from that is amazing. How much Dick McDonald brings to this equation is far-reaching and utterly stupefying to me. The Golden Arches, they were his, and he named them. Now, just to show you how it remains as the background radiation of our lives... Let's go to the two logo images I sent you. The first one. Uh, this one? Yes. First of all, is an example of their fluidity. It starts as McDonald's famous barbecue. And there's nothing to speak of with that logo. Any kid could do it. The next logo, the black and white one on the top right. Okay. That's passable. And you see that on the original restaurant. Now. Well, buy them by the bag. <laughs> Good slogan. <laughs> back when you could. Mm. nowadays man um now the bottom is the mcdonald's one that you see on the very first googie architecture uh example that we see in the movie i'll get back to that one in just a moment as an aside now come to the next logo picture i've got you on the now on the very left you see a logo that it makes an appearance at the latter half of this movie and it's clearly based on and is a stylistic representation of the building right 
And that's what I said to my wife. Well, I, was, I was writing up for this episode or just getting my bits together. And I was like, I've never realized that about McDonald's. It's not an M. It one is, but it's not based on an M. It's based on those arches. If you look at it, uh, if you look at that M there, the one on the far right, and then look at this restaurant, bam, you see it. Mm-hmm. Now, you see the makings of it, and it evolves further from there. And, and it, of course, becomes, well, yeah, it could be an M. Why not? Uh, <laughs> did Dick McDonald see that? At some point, uh, other people have to be creative and add and contribute to something. Uh but think about that. Dick McDonald in relative obscurity and with no help except from that of his adorable brother, Mac, comes up with all of that. I found a googie, re- I found a googie coffee shop to share with you, if you would like me to. Googie, googie, googie. Please. There we, go. there we go. Yeah, yeah. You can see. It's just so obvious. Yeah. The angles, the colors, the boom. The neon, the glass, the glass. yeah. And it, uh, speak the one the side I wanted to come to very briefly is that uh, as an architectural render by trade, among other trades, I am struck by the fact that Ray Kroc got suckered in by uh, the architectural rendering that was done clearly by Stanley Clark Meston and his architecture firm. And uh, he looks at it, and he is caught by that, spellbound by that. Boom! That's what we shoot for whenever we do an architectural rendering, man. It's that, that speech he gives about, you know, you see giant crosses, you see a church, you know. He's like, why can't people congregate underneath these golden arches instead of a church? Well, well, we'll get you know, to but... that. That's the conclusion he draws from seeing this rendering and then from going to see the building that, and and phoenix that was built on that pattern but what i'm saying is somebody in that architecture firm painted that painting of a building not yet built based on plans made in with clear oversight by dick mcdonald and that alone is enough to catch ray Kroc. aside from the system and the fact that the burger he has is pretty damn good in other words dick mcdonald's creativity is what catches Ray. Now, what conclusion Ray draws from that is correct. He understands this in terms of symbols, symbols having power, weight. And, uh, you know, yeah, I've driven everywhere. I've, I've gone to town after town after town. I've seen churches and I've seen a lot of courthouses. And the churches, on the top of the churches, you've got a cross. And on the courthouses, you got flag and what you need is these arches could be a symbol of that sort of communal uh, interaction only it's got to do with food rather than in the church or civil service and um uh, you get you, you just have an arch instead of these other symbols a cross flag arch <laughs> i mean his his vision is, is actually brilliant you know, he does have a very good business mind. You know, there is something to be said about that. He is right. And uh, the point makes it clear that the cycle continues. At some point later in the film, he runs out of uh, ideas. And the person who bails him out is another person with another creative idea, Harry Sonneborn, who says, no, it's about real estate, not about food. Uh, by BJ, BJ Novak. There you go. Mm. And 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 uh, just as just as uh, just as Sonneborn does with him, Croc does that with the McDonald's brothers. The McDonald's brothers are incredibly creative, clearly, but that has its limits. They don't see other things that Ray does see. Ray sees them and expands the business, but in turn, uh, in turn. Sonneborn sees things that Croc cannot see, and it expands further. That's how creativity quite often works, with one budding from another, budding off from another, budding off from another. Yes. 
it's funny that I'm seeing the film in terms of creativity when this is business, but it, it, tell me that creativity has nothing to do with business. Me and you had a great conversation in the week. Um, me, me and Eric do this. We have a good powwows where we sit on the phone for a good hour, hour and a half. And I was talking about graphic design as being some of the most important. And you know, Eric is, of, of course, the master. Um, you know, graphic design is some of the most important art out there because it's got to be, it's got to be um, kinetic art. It's got to show people um, the way. You know, if you if you're going to create a, a logo for something like McDonald's, it's got to be something alluring, right? Mm -hmm. As I said at that time, advertising art is kinetic in that its purpose is to move you to desire what the advertising art's presenting. I am learning on this show. I'm learning and I hope the listeners are too. <laughs> there we go. Mm. <laughs> but what I've said also is that the rules are blurred when it comes to that sort of thing. And that initial spark moment that catches you before drawing you in is static, not mm. kinetic. It holds you in place. Wow. In other words, it stops you from doing whatever the hell else you were doing that day and makes you go, oh, wow. And then when you've taken in the wow and absorbed the information presented in that wow, however long that static moment is, you take it in and go, oh, it's about something that I want now. I think I'm going to get it. That is mm -hmm. kinetic. You're now moved to go, I'm going to get it. Yeah. Or yeah. I'm going to run away from it. That's didactic slash aversion based, but we get there when we see Ray Kroc being a bit of a bastard later. <laughs> it's both. It's both. Uh, it's both. A, a, it's both attracting and averting. So it is kinetic, Whoa, but overall, I mean, when get together, it's static. That middle logo there is the McDonald's logo from when I was a kid, right? That's when I was a kid, and I see that on a bag or on a, on, a, on an advert on a bus or something like that or on TV. And I'd be like, oh, I, I, I really want a cheeseburger. Keep like, this up for a moment make... for, uh, for a couple yeah, reasons. But yeah, now uh, here's why. Um, first of all, magnificent choice of yellow in the backdrop. It matches perfectly. And it matches perfectly with the red live uh, little thing in the upper left corner that may or may not be apparent <laughs> later. Also, red and yellow, red and yellow. One thing I remembered sticking out to me from one Bar Rescue episode is John Taffer saying that in terms of color theory, red and yellow stimulate food sales. He says, think of how many food establishments use red and yellow. Not just McDonald's, Burger King. Name them. Yeah. Wendy's, list them. Yeah, Wimpy. How, can, Wimpy. Uh, can you can you name uh, a chain off the top of your head besides the ones I have that's red and red and yellow in it? Sonic. Uh, yeah, there's lots. There's lots. Yeah. And the point I'm trying to make by saying all that is to establish all of that may very well have been, for all I know, the invention of Dick McDonald via the architect Stanley Clark Meston and and Mr. Fish. That's bizarre, but true. Big things have small beginnings. So God knows where I wa where we are in the story at this point, because uh, I had to just go vomitous regarding design, mm -hmm. the impact of logos, and all that, and the fact that as an architectural renderer, I respond to, oh, somebody made an architectural rendering, and it caught Ray Kroc, and for that we have all that came afterwards, including the fact that I can buy burgers and make myself look like burgers. Wow. But in terms of... A... Sorry, go... I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go on, I found go a on. I, I found a wimpy in Illinois that looks uh, almost almost the same as that original, uh, this, this stand here. It is so similar. Let's see it. Um, Okay, I'll bring it up. You keep talking, and I'll uh, I'll I'll do it. Well, okay. Oh, okay. gosh, 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 gosh. Get rid of that. It's bizarre that oh. I've completely derailed the train of thought, and all the passengers are either dead or horribly injured. And <laughs> no, but this is the point, though. We're talking about art here, and, and like you know, McDonald's set a trend. They set a trend, and we want to we want to get on, in on this, you know. So it's important. Mm -hmm. But it also comes back to perhaps the, one of the base principles of this series is like, can Eric Pfluger actually get something deeper thoughtful out of a fucking cheeseburger? 
Berber? <laughs> Burger? Motherfucking watch me. I'll play this tuba. <laughs> I'll play it with a oh. side order of fries. Well, I mean, what is graphic design? What is this kind of this kind of design? What is it? It's a shortcut into making money, isn't it? You see something and you relate straight to I want to buy so I want to buy that. I want to part with my money um and give it to you because of how how great this looks. And look at this wimpy. There it oh, gorgeous. You know? Now, is that outright googie, or is it a, perhaps a kind of neo googie? I don't know. I, I'll have to look it up and research. It's kind of modern as well, doesn't it? You know, very much. Uh, it's gorgeous. Mm. Hungry yet, everybody? Yeah, I haven't eaten yet today. Do you have a favorite kind of hamburger? I mean, do you prefer it like the thin and crispy on the edges, say steak and shake, Five Guys kind of burger? Or is it more of a big, freaking fat and meat, meaty burger that just sends juice running down your arms and you don't give a shit? Sorry to the listeners that are like struggling for through in between lunch and dinner right now. They're probably like, "Oh, you bastards!" Um, no, uh, sometimes I, I'll have a hankering for a Big Mac. That Big Mac sauce is the don, right? That Big Mac sauce is fantastic. But I also appreciate a, a Whopper, a double Whopper. What? Are you kidding me? Let's do this. Mm. You know. But we're talking about kinds of burgers. And, and, and by the way, let's not knock Wendy's here. Um, <laughs> totally not. Nice. And so you got your, you got your, your, your gourmet sort of beef proper steak style burgers or your thin sort of fast food type burgers. Um, I think if you, if you just in a, in a mood just to, just to fuck up your life just for about you know <laughs> half an hour and then pick up the pieces later, it's definitely a McDonald's. If you want to go out for a meal with your friends and have a couple of pints or even with the family, pub lunch somewhere a nice big greasy burger is exactly what i need yeah full confession here uh both last night when i watched it in order to bone up and the time prior prior to that when i watched it i couldn't watch it without eating mcdonald's while watching the film about mcdonald's eric said to me by the way when we were pl planning this he goes i'm gonna make sure i've got mcdonald's on the table uh whilst we're recording this um <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Uh, just imagine you like dipping into the fries. Just like, yeah, so uh, <laughs> they're really good. No, no, no. no we, I the met. I, I ended up meeting the plan halfway because I have a McChicken sandwich in the fr fridge waiting for me. But last <laughs> night, yeah, I got myself a Big Mac. I got myself a chicken sandwich and, and a bunch of fries. Orange high C. <laughs> Talk to me, Michael Keaton. <laughs> Speaking of Michael Keaton, great segue. I noticed a change in him as soon as he met Sonnenberg. As soon as he, as he realised that it was, there is a way to take this from the McDonald brothers, as soon as he realised there was a plan in place, that's when the bastard came out. Do you agree? Mm. Well, um, although, according to what I've read, real life depicts it somewhat more amicably uh, than the movie paints it. What I've discovered is that the film appears to have been based on the autobiography written by Ray Kroc. And what seems to be apparent, at least at a quick perusal, is that that autobiography and an earlier 1970s article in Time make clear that Ray Kroc is kind of posturing himself as an I'm a killer businessman. I chew them up and spit them out. I, I, I ran the brothers out of their own restaurant. Yeah, fear me. But it turns out not necessarily to have been the case. And let's see if I can come up with what research I have on that that says a bit more of the truth. Mm -hmm. And for a source, I'm going with Hold on as I switch from thing to thing. It's fine. It's fine. Again, freeform jazz, but it has its drawbacks. I'm going with Nisa, Lisa Napoli, who wrote herself a book about the McDonald's story okay. called Ray and Joan, the man who made the McDonald's fortune and the woman who gave it all away. In terms of charity, we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. um, what... 
what it seems to be the case here is, um, hold on, we'll get there. Here we are. Uh, it, it basically says that the movie says they got screwed, but no, not necessarily. They didn't. Um, it says uh, uh, Napoli is being interviewed, and she, she asked, "Did they calibrate the emotional intensity of their relationship of the of the estrangement between the brothers and Ray? Did they calibrate the emotional intensity of that in an accurate way?" Napoli goes, well, the emotional intensity was accurate. The specifics were not accurate. Basically, what happened was that McDonald's grew and grew, and Ray needed the brothers to go away. He needed to rewrite the agreement so that he could own the whole company so that they could be positioned to go public. He wants to get out from under that. He is now shown a way via Son and Born uh, to do that. Yeah. So... Let me see. Uh, the best I can do is read and quote from them. It's better than me just wandering around drooling. <laughs> Everything is not like a lecture, as I said. The interviewer. So there's a crucial moment in the film where Ray Kroc wants to get out from underneath this long-standing contract that he has with the McDonald's brothers. The brothers can decide almost everything about how McDonald's does its business. So Ray Kroc wants out, so they cut a deal. Money will change hands. But there seems to be this agreement. The original McDonald's brothers want to get a percentage of future profits. Now, I'm jumping ahead a bit, but that's part of my slapdash research. That's, that's but if part I, of the, the... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I mean, that, that's part of the, the, the film where I kind of disliked... The, the only time I really disliked the McDonald's brothers is the fact that, you know, you got Ray, Ray Kroc literally putting his house on the line, traveling from one side of the country to the other, buying up plots of land and stuff. Well, these guys are just earning, they're just raking the profits at the time. You know, they, 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 yes, they're running a restaurant, but they're running a restaurant while this empire has been built for them by, for, by somebody else, you know? Well, the problem being also that, remember that they got that far before Ray showed up by being, as I said, fluid, flexible, they're now completely inflexible with regard to how they deal with Ray. Their, their system that they put into place is not flexible. It doesn't move fast enough. It isn't moving effectively mm. enough. Ray's not wrong. Yeah. Not that I can see in that sense. But then again, remember what I said about Michael Corleone. Uh, the situation kind of positioned him in a way that, no, he wasn't wrong. And he was, in a sense, winning. But he uh, did make an ethical lapse, nevertheless. Now, Ray Kroc yeah. doesn't going around and, and doesn't going around shooting people in the eye through their glasses. Well, this is the image <laughs> they, we get. This is this is the image we get. Opening McDonald's. There you go. Going around the country. Now come on oh, to this geez. wonderful restaurant. I'm. He's, <laughs> God, I love this. He is a bit of a caricature in that sense, but that's yeah. fine. I. I I don't mind that. It gives me something to work with. But where was, but where was, oh yes, the Dan thing. Uh, the, it basically comes down to, I'm going to try to put a spear in the movie's central conceit that he screwed them because he got so mad at them. According to Napoli, that's the essential falsehood of the movie. The brothers did get a percentage of the profits. Uh, the falsehood in the movie is that Ray screwed the brothers out of the half a percent. The original deal was 1.9% of a franchisee's profits. It went to the McDonald's Corporation, and 0.5% of that went to Dick and Mac McDonald. What happened was that Ray and the brothers were at odds. He went to them and said, look, what is it going to take to make you go away? They said $2.7 We want a million dollars each and 700000 to pay our taxes. That's how practical they were. And they were happy with that. It was 1961, and the problem was that Ray didn't have anywhere close to $2.7 million to give them. He, I said in another piece that I read that, yeah, he, he paid them the $2.7 by having to spend $14 million. 
as you point out, it's important to remember that McDonald's was precipitately close to folding at every step of the game once Ray got involved because he didn't have the right scheme to make McDonald's grow until he met Harry Sonneborn, who came along and told him it's not about hamburgers, it's about real estate. So the interviewer asked, so I want to understand this carefully. A million dollars each in current money is about eight million each, just to put this into some inflation perspective. But the movie says that at the end, McDonald's brothers wanted some percentage of future profits and that there was a handshake deal for that, but that the brothers never got the money. Your reporting says, what actually happened there? And so Napoli says, basically, Ray was able to come up with a $2.7 million. The brothers were invited to Chicago. They got their check. They went back home. They lived out the rest of their lives. What made them angry was that they were never given credit in the corporate hemisphere for many, many years. They were erased from history. You don't know, Napoli says, when you start something that it's going to become a major international corporation. And the brothers didn't know that. They knew and had seen McDonald's grow under Ray's watch, but they didn't know that it one day would have tens of thousands of restaurants all over the world. And they were older at that point anyway. They were retired. They were comfortable. They were fine to walk away. Now, that's not to say that Ray wasn't a tough guy and Ray was ruthless, Nopoli says, but he didn't screw them out of a half a percent of royalty. Hmm. So what makes clear is that the movie is, like Amadeus, something of a fantasia on real life events in order to make a larger point about a man's moral decline and fall I now know, the question back then to to you know two and a half million dollars back then is still quite a lot of money right you know it's not a small amount of money at all a million dollars back then was was considered far huger amount than it is now correct most certainly uh and i think we're looking at it through the lens of uh, the creators of Superman didn't get their due for a long time. You know, a lot of people do get screwed. And by the way, the McDonald's brothers themselves were so leery of being screwed that that's what uh, made them to have that ironclad agreement that Ray wanted to get out from under in the first place. Um. Now, the one thing I wanted to make uh, all of that hay earlier uh, about real life and real life is for a reason. Stop that. So sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm having a couple of connection issues. Let me just reset my, my router. Give me this is a great bit of editing. Hey, <laughs> I will get this connected. Don't worry. Uh, connect. We are experiencing some technical difficulties. Please stand by. I can hear you now. It was my headphones. My headphones were dying. There we go. Hello. We're still recording. So uh, right, what I'll do is three, two, one. Yes. And so we're my... back. <laughs> so, yeah, a million dollars was worth a lot of money back then. Um, correct? It was. And in, inflation translates that into uh, substantially more. God only knows how much. Um but okay, I floundered around a little bit before reading facts to the point where I just lost my breath. And I ended up doing that mostly because I hadn't pre-planned, because it's free-form jazz today here on Clouds. And also because uh, I ended up wanting to make a larger point, which is, okay, according to what research I have been able to do, Ray Kroc didn't screw them in the way that this movie presents it. Mm-hmm. And so the question is, is that good? Should we be happy with that? And the only reason perhaps we shouldn't be is because I know at the back of my head that most people won't undertake any further research. They will be content with going, okay, this is how McDonald's got started. Fine, I'll move on. Ray Kroc screwed them. The brothers were freaking burned. Yeah. So I, that is, I, I guess if you're a history buff like me, that's a bad thing because you want people to have at least an accurate rendering of what actually happened because Lord knows we are living in an era where we see what happens when people don't have accurate renderings of history relate to them or indeed anything else. 
But still, should I be that guy? Am I yelling at a cloud when I say that? Because in the end, uh, can I make the same uh, critique about Amadeus? Well, actually, yeah, to a certain extent I could. But then does that matter? Or should we just accept Amadeus as what its creator says it is? A bit of a fantasia based on history. Same here with the founder. Uh, I mean, to go on a tangent, it's a bit, it's a bit like it's a bit like the the Bob Kane Bill Finger argument with Batman, right? So that too, Bill F- yeah, yeah, he was uncredited uh, for so many years, and then all of a sudden, people are like, hold on, wasn't there a co creator of Batman and Bob Kane? Yeah, Bill Finger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I wanted everybody to see this marvelous comic book. <laughs> <laughs> He's playing everybody now, including Bob Kane. He could probably. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Keaton is Bob Kane. Uh, But yeah, it feels like that. It plays into that archetype of screwage, and that's why we respond to it. And it certainly paints uh, Ray Kroc Corleone as uh, as a crab apple, doesn't he? Yeah. And he does it does it does change because that that's one of the most one of the most stunning things I found about Keaton's performance is he does start off as that bumbling idiot, and he suddenly, as soon as he he meets um, uh, um, the 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 the, uh, the financial expert, and you know he explains that he can actually make something for himself, he just changes. He becomes that monster, and it's displayed in this one of the most grit, or one of the most brutal scenes I've seen in a while. Um, and that's the the scene when they're having din- dinner with his wife, and he's picking through the carrots, and then you just see them just just not even they're not talking they're just munching on the food, and he just comes up with I want a divorce. That is a carrot heavy dinner, man. That is, that is it. Really is. That's definitely a post war meal. That is, uh, <laughs> and I, I just want to I want a divorce. That's and- it. And she look looks up like what. <laughs> Two observations from that. First of all, yeah, it does feel sort of like this man's version of Michael Corleone closing the door on Kay, Mm -hmm. as he does twice in those damn movies. Uh, But then it also speaks to a a problem I have with this film, and it does have its problems, and that is that Laura Dern, God bless her, is given very little to do on the page. Uh, You do understand her character, she is just long suffering. As I said, to be the wife or I should say partner and or support system of a creative person is very difficult. It's not necessarily one to be envied. She isn't in an enviable position here. <clears throat> yes, he is a creative person, albeit frustrated until as Kevin says, the creativity of one person inspires others. And, and, but, but Laura is just, uh, left with so little to do and God only knows if, if I'm saying that this is a Fantasia only partly based on history, then it isn't necessarily obliged that she be just so you're in this. If page says that she is uh, what she, what is there is what she herself brings to it. Not what the page brings to it. And I think it's kind of typified by this scene. She can deliver more emotion or more power or something greater than this. But she is so defeated by this point that she is, A, in shock, and then just uh, utterly deflates. Now, granted, this film is filled with little moments like that where it's subtle acting rather than broad or gross acting. But I don't know if it served the scene that well. It's nothing but quiet at that point. And you kind of just feel that she deserves to say, What the fuck? <laughs> you fucking burger person. Oh. But it's, it's that, that scene, you know, when they're talking about the divorce. Uh, you know, divorces can be very difficult, you know. Uh, uh, you know, what, what's she going to be owed? And he's like, she gave the house, the car, everything. And they talk about the business. And he goes, she's not going to get a dime. And as long like, as I live. Oh, wow. That, that's how much he hates her. That's how much he hates her. He's like, she's not going to get a penny of this. Because all she's done for the whole process is whine and moan. <laughs> it's just brilliant. 
You know, I have a feeling that the, ultimately if I could boil Ray Kroc as depicted in this film down to a simple sentence, it's that he has been frustrated, hindered, not kept down necessarily, but this is more than just a sentence. He's a man that feels, has felt weak entirely up to a certain point. And when he finally has something that allows him to feel a sense of strongness, he holds on to it and is willing to keep that. And if he has to throw every other aspect of his life that is a hindrance out of this way, he will do it. Hmm. And and I think that plays into the fact that he, in his autobiography, in this Time article I mentioned, really attempts to beat his own chest and paint himself as, I'm a badass business person. It is publicly expressed strength coming from an inward sense of weakness, I think, that makes him go, it's dog eat dog and rat eat rat, and I'm going to chew you up and spit you out, and I wouldn't help anybody. I would make them drown if they were drowning. And if you yeah. can't be like that, you're out of my way. If you can't help me and be a support, help me, I want a divorce. Or I'll buy you out. Or whatever. The, the, there's a certain arrogance as well to him that he that, that is embedded into him early into the film when when he's, you know, he's trying to get franchisees from the club, you know, uh, these white collar people that have just seem to have a fortune and don't really care about the details. It's all about the details. And, you know, they mess up the point. Le lettuce. Lettuce. You know, and when he's waving that piece of lettuce at the guy, I'm just like, oh my God. But that's true. Like, you know, he's he's got that. And yes, they're like, he is dude, I'm retired. I just needed a place to park my money. Yeah, yeah. But what that shows is it's not entirely self-interested. He does care about the mm -hmm. standards, the business, perhaps even if only in the sense that he can't, be he can't be his own badass self-image of himself if this thing isn't up to standards i can't be a badass if this burger looks like shit yeah. i can't i can't be like i can't be burger trump <laughs> burger, burger trump if oh. if there's garbage lying around these golden arches and if there's a bunch of like greasers and punks hanging around this place now that's McDonald's. That's all McDonald's is. Is punks hanging around all the place. I mean, the one, the one around the corner from me. You walk in, there's all these kids at midnight that are kind of snuck out of the house or whatever. They're all crowded, you know, pre-COVID, of course. Um, but you know, you pointed out something. He's arrogant. That ultimately is his single flaw. It's his tragic flaw. That's what makes this a tragedy, and it's what makes this art static. And it's what is the. It's why he can't be satisfied with the moderate success he has started the film with. Mm. Yeah. To an extent, more. Dick McDonald has that too, but there is a ceiling both to his arrogance and to his ambitions. I think it's more about the model they put in place. They kind of like admire us, admire what we made. We made the speedy system, love this thing. You know, they created fast food in a way. So. Whereas, whereas the difference between the two people is, um, Croc wanted to take over the world with it. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rule the world. Burgers, you're all gonna bow at my golden arches. <laughs> Seven days a week. <laughs> um, and you know, it's so funny that the behind this weird funny voice of his it really comes down to a whole nother mindset i'm a huge badass in business okay i buy people out i i, I chew them up I, I spit them out it's dog eat dog it's rat eat rat and i'm gonna act that way I, because i expect that everyone else acts that way and i'm really doing all this to just compensate for something inside me okay yeah is that not him? I'm totally doing this because I'm somehow empty until burgers came into my life. And it's self-explanatory. There's that phone call that they have. It's like, um, you know, when you're explaining, he's like, oh, if I saw you drown in a pool, I'll put a fucking hose in your mouth or whatever he says. Can you say the same? And then, um, you know, one of the McDonald brothers is like, no, I can't say the same and I wouldn't want to either. And it's like, well, that's the difference between you and me. You know, that, that's, he didn't say that, but that's what he's implying. Well, that's the difference between you and me, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm a wolf and you're a sheep. 
There you go. Well, actually, the difference is a bit subtle. Recall that he begins this movie listening to a motivational record by this certain Dr. Clarence mm. Floyd Nelson. Was he a real person? I, I will have to look that up. But he's talking about this power of positive thinking stuff. And the way uh, Ray Kroc chooses to interpret it is, of course, very predatory. But he wouldn't be Ray Kroc otherwise. But let's go through that speech now. It's not – it's a, apparently the thing that he, Ray Kroc thinks makes the difference between Dick and Mac and him is what the one – word of the record begins with persistence let's go over that speech persistence nothing in the world can take the place of persistence the record says talent won't nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent hey fuck you resemble <laughs> that remark genius won't fuck you some more unrewarded genius is practically a cliche education won't Fuck you some more. The world is full of educated fools. Persistence and determination alone are all powerful. Show that you don't have to be defeated by anything. That you can have peace of mind, improved health, and a never-ceasing flow of energy. If you attempt each and every day to achieve these things, the results will make themselves obvious to you. Well, it may sound like a magical notion. It is in you to create your own future. The greatest discovery of my generation, the record goes, is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. So the tragedy is, is that his arrogance leads him to believe that the change in his attitude means he's got to become a killer. And that that killer means unrestricted ambition unrestricted expansion unrestricted growth and the fact of the matter is is that as napoli says the brothers were quite content with the growth they had i found uh, i found out about the uh, the the record by the way is it is fictional ah. um, I've, i went on cura which is of course you know, not always going to get the right answer on Cura. Uh, but Roger Klein uh, says mm -hmm. the album, uh, as seen and heard in the film, is a bit of uh, modified mashup. Its artwork is a, a pastiche fake of The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. Um, and it says that the uh, it was, it was uh, the, the person who read it, who played Dr. Clarence Floyd Nelson, is an actor, and it was largely based um, on... Uh, the words spoken by Calvin Coolidge, ha. who's the 30th president of the United States. There you mm. go. But is it, it's both amazing the actual content of this speech the guy gives, and it's also amazing how Ray Kroc has chosen to either interpret or misinterpret it. He's certainly viewing it through the skewed lens of, I have the power to make the world into something I want, but what I want is... I'm kind of like Dr. Reinhardt again. I want to take over everything. I want to uh, dethrone God and take that throne, and it's mine, damn it, and it's going to look he, like a giant burger. He wants a big old slice of that pie, doesn't he? He's the American dream right there. Mm. That's what he wants. Mm. It's, yeah. But here we are, though. All of The thing is that strikes me is that, yes, it's about fast food. Yes, it's about real estate. But these things are actually, it's about creativity. It's a creative notion that Dick McDonald brings into this. It's a creative notion that Ray Kroc contributes to this. It is even a creative notion uh, that, uh, that Sonneborn brings to this. Creativity is the thing that powers this engine and moves it forward. The engine simply happens to sell burgers. Um, and as well, one of the most important facts of this is the milkshakes. The milkshakes are a huge part of this, you know, because obviously um, Dick and Mac want to have traditional food. It's a milkshake. It's got to have milk in it, you know. And so obviously to save money, uh, Ray creates these powder milk or finds these powder milkshakes as um, introduced to him by Joan Smith. Um, and, you know, they, they try to sell the idea of these milkshakes to the McDonald's brothers, and they're like, absolutely not. No work. They're not doing it. And he undermines them 
uh, and starts you know, <laughs> distributing them nationally apart from to the McDonald's Brothers restaurant, which I thought was a right kick in the teeth. And that caused a lot of friction throughout the movie. Um, but, you know, re- you know, it says afterwards, it comes up with the subtitles that eventually McDonald's started selling real milkshakes again. I was just like, wow, after all that, you know. I should like to taste one of these powder milkshakes mm. just to see. I mean, it's not necessarily presented to me in a way that I would want because the damn milkshake tempress, temptress <laughs> playing the piano comes over with, I've got these milkshake, powder milkshakes. And she My milkshake slowly and salaciously <laughs> stirs it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'd teach you, but I'd have to charge. <laughs> I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. I wonder how much of that was true, though. Did he send a box, a nice, a nicely presented box with one sachet? Yeah, they come in strawberry now. Fuck you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I, I must. uh, That's the one of the weaknesses of of freeform jazz format here, because Lord knows if we had time to research this, we probably could have answered that. Oh, funny you say, Eric. I've got a time machine in the back here. Let's go back and find out. (laughs) Lee, to Lee, to Lee, to Lee. We've had time to research now. I wonder, no, but, I mean, it would certainly have prevented my just babbling off interview text no, for a bit, 10 minutes and boring people. But what this leaves is, uh, listeners, is is room for discussion. So if you do know something about this movie, if you do know any facts that m- maybe we're wrong, then write into us. Let us know. You know, you, we go to the Usuk fan page, Usuk uh, Facebook page. Um, email us. Usuk, uh, no, that's more like Usuk, it. Usuk Global at gmail.com drop us a line and we will we'll bring up your uh your you know <laughs> your facts in the next show and we'll discuss it genuinely because we don't know everything and that's the important thing even as big as eric's brain is uh it doesn't hold all the knowledge of the world so let's discuss that's important it's more like the hamburger than you believe it's just a bunch of chopped meat in there <laughs> look at him beautiful and a sour expression <laughs> um, I want to give a, a, a good shout out to John Lee Hancock as well, who's the director for this film. Because mm. um, upon researching for this film, his his history and the, the the movies he's directed. Let me just read out the the, the movies he's directed. Uh, so we've got um, ha, uh, the the Rookie, the Alamo, the Blind Side, Saving Mr. Banks, the Founder, the Highwaymen, and What's the little things here that he's got? You just floored me because you bring up saving Mr. Banks and you kind of just back ended into the very, into the other point that I granted was bringing up earlier to a degree, but saving Mr. Banks just reminds me again, we are now at this point in our culture where characters that invented the things that are the cultural background radiation of our lives are now being held up for fictionalization. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ray Kroc, the man who helped give us our hamburgers, Walt Disney, the man who helped give us some aspects of our childhoods. Goofy. (laughs) Oh, hi. (laughs) And now all of these things are being held up for cinematic portrayal and, and, and with star power behind them. Michael Keaton is Mr. McDonald's. Uh, Tom Hanks is Mr. Walt Disney. Uh, All of that. Are you not struck by that? I'd love to speak to this guy. Have you ever seen the blind side? It's a, such an amazing, powerful movie. No, Um, I'll have to. It's really good. I'd, I'd recommend a watch, but I'd love to speak to this guy because to be able to direct someone, like to go up to Michael Keaton during this and to be like, um, you're trying to sell milkshakes, but um, just be an idiot. Let's just let be really like, and then turn up the, the, the volume a bit. Like, you know, uh, don't, to, don't actually tell these guys to fuck, go fuck themselves, but say it in your facial expression. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's a talent. Real talent. I'm stuck now with the image of Tom Hanks's Walt Disney. Uh, mm-hmm. Perhaps one day we may do a sort of companion episode to this nothing burger of an episode by doing that. And, and <laughs> I've never seen about... Mr. Banks. Save Mr. I've never seen it, so I'll have to watch it. I wonder if I'll feel obliged to actually watch Mary Poppins afterwards or beforehand. Indeed. 
<laughs> like eating the Big Mac while watching this. Ironically, the Big Mac was rather like the powder milkshakes. It was something that a franchisee decided that was an interesting idea and, and, and upper management said, yeah, that's good. Let's try it and then go global. Nationwide. Absolutely. And the funny thing about the milkshakes and indeed the burgers that they were serving at the beginning of the film is, do we have any possible way of knowing what uh, the actual burgers tasted like as opposed to the ones that we can get hold of now or what the actual milkshakes tasted like as opposed to the ones we get now or as opposed to the powdered milkshakes? I bet you, I bet you can like look at the ingredients and how they were made and make replica McDonald's. I'd like to compare it. I mean, I have to assume that uh, there's aspects of the original recipe in the burgers today, or why would it? Why would? God knows. I mean, yes, it's reproduced and, and, and frozen and all of that, and whatever machine age horror uh, aspect you want to apply to it. I have to believe that at some point there's some aspect of the original McDonald recipe that is replicated. In um, and you know we had a, conf- a, a discussion. Sorry, somebody's uh, rang me in regards to Pod Aid. I was like, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. I'm recording. Um, no, uh, we had a discussion about what else did Ray Kroc, you know, mess about with? Because obviously we were talking about the milkshakes, weren't we? And mm. I was like, well, you know, you think about McDonald's and you think of the McRib and the, you know the stuff that he used to put in the burgers and you know of during the 70s, 80s when they just didn't give a shit, like. Um, so you know when you when you talk about what did a McDonald's burger actually taste like, I think you'd have to pick a decade. <laughs> Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. Hmm. In a sense, then it is like art in that if you look at a given piece of art on a given subject, you could tell what period it was made in in a certain way. Nicholas Meyer put it. Uh, in these terms, you could make a movie about 1776. It could be made in either 1976, 1986, 1996. And you could probably tell to within a few years about when that film was made, simply because all art is indelibly and ineluctably the product of the times in which it's made. Can I apply that to the culinary arts in the form of a burger recipe? I wonder. Hmm. Well, there are certain aspects to art that just keep reoccurring with McDonald's. Obviously, these arches, um, you know, the the logos here that we see. And even Justin Timberlake, which is a weird pull. Well, that da-da-da-da-da, I'm loving it. He got paid $6 million for that. And And yet it stuck, didn't it? It's art. It's art. You know, it's one of those things that you, you hear and you know instantly, that's McDonald's. You know, I already a took a shit on the line at least once during the show. So <laughs> notice, by the way, that there is barely any patty in my sandwich. Where's the beef indeed? Yeah. So w- what I wonder is this film has a great deal of ambiguity as to who is quote unquote right. Isn't it? He's I he's clearly in the wrong as to the way he treats his wife and it, people in general as a person. But in terms of policy, is he right to want powdered milkshakes? Are the brothers wrong to not want it? Is he wrong to want flexibility in the agreement? And are they wrong not to want flexibility? Hmm. Is he wrong to have it be real estate rather than burgers? And are they wrong and wanted it to be burgers over real estate? And, you know, you've got to look at, you do have to look at the time as well and the, the period of which, which this all happened. You know, you're talking about a guy who, when he was young, was an ambulance driver in World War, was it World War One? He was an, uh, an ambulance driver mm. or World War Two. I need to find that out. But, you know, he's an ambulance driver during the war. He would have seen some terrible things. There's certainly a, 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 an amount of, like, I just want to make money. I want to make business. I don't want to be involved in any of that sort of stuff. And he's got that, 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 Thing you know, inside him that's made him a bit tougher than most as well, you know. But th- th- these things happen when people went to war, um, so you do have to look at the period as well when it, when it was made. Like th- these are tough sons of bitches that I've seen an awful lot. Mm. So when it comes to the dog eat dog thing, there's there's no sympathy there because you know there's a lot of people 
uh, in their way of that success. So, and, and the brothers understand that as well as anyone to a point because, as I said, they are survivors. They uh, they figured out how to at least survive, if not moderately flourish, before Ray Kroc showed up. And they were made that way partly because it's a tough world, uh, so to speak. Now, funny thing is, perhaps all of these people are at the, at the mercy of larger historical forces anyway. And how can I possibly say that? There's one last piece of interview that I think I can read that applies to that, and then I'll stop boring people to tears with that. And let's see, in order to do that, I got to, ah, here we are. It says that these people kind of were at the mercy of the post-World War II landscape they were living in. A period where everyone was falling in love with a car, in which because the car allowed greater uh, distance of travel, suburbs develop, and more travel in general. Um Families were likely to be their biggest customers. They clearly saw that. But here's what they said. Back when McDonald's started, Monopoly says again, people were used to eating at local places. There was no option, in fact. There were few options that weren't local. Now here's what the franchise opportunity seems to fill in terms of a gap in a market. Napoli says, what happened was, as we became more mobile as a culture, we wanted consistency. We didn't want to risk when we walked into a restaurant in a new town that we'd driven to with our families or on business that the place we'd go into was going to stink. So we started looking for brands and chains that were familiar because that way we knew we'd get the same sort of food we'd get back home. In other words a certain sense of trustworthiness. And doesn't Ray speak to that? And don't the brothers seem to get that? They seem to have totally understood that before Ray shows up. We want the same number of pickles on everything, the same amount of ketchup and mustard on each one, and the, the, the whole point of the speedy system was to facilitate that sameness. Milk, shake, milk. There's milk in milkshake. <laughs> <laughs> but you are, but okay. That's the basic forces that made something like a franchise like McDonald's necessary. The brothers were actually in vogue, Napoli says, as far as preparation. They were, but they were very typical of the times of wanting to be a locally sourced kind of game in town. And it was the whole force behind McDonald's, Napoli says, as much as it was Ray, that made it necessary to have standardized fast food in the worst sense of the word. In other words, that need for sameness combined with the need to make it economical to produce that sameness main, meant that, at least for a while, Ray thought that powdered milkshakes were necessary. The film provides at least a plausible reason why, because it costs a lot to refrigerate all that ice cream. Mm -hmm. And how is that different in terms of shaving off an expense from what the brothers themselves did in terms of shaving off Unnecessary food items, the waitresses who serve you, uh, the plates, the forks and knives. How is that different? It is in a certain sense when you parse it down to a certain sense of principle. Yes. But was that principle even possible? For a while, apparently it wasn't. But apparently it was eventually possible because, as you said, they did eventually get back to milk and ice cream in the milkshakes. But they had to figure out how, apparently. Or perhaps a third way was eventually found. I don't know. I'm not the yeah, milkshake the, scientist. The ice cream machine, doesn't it? That keeps churning it around. That's why the ice cream right. machine's always put. Yeah, yeah. I, a technology tends to solve problems. And Ray Kroc saw this as technology solving a problem. Were the brothers being old-fashioned sticks in the mud? Had they gotten entirely too used to having that level of George Lucas control? So... <laughs> so to speak, so that when the, when Ray's like, God damn it, I can't get this business functioning in a way that brings in any money if this thing is so unreactive and won't move fast enough because they want written permission for everything. Of course he'd jump. 
Mm-hmm. So you see, the damn milkshake is not the damn trigger. It's simply, well, it it may be the spark, but the gasoline was spilled for a while. Yeah, yeah. So I think we've used up the whole question of, is it possible for them to have not been assholes? Uh, I think, what, you know, they had one had one idea. The others had a different idea, you know. They had this thing, yeah. They created it, but what do you do with that thing when you've made it? You know, and that's mm. that's the that's the the uh, the back end two that we have there is that yes, they created the speedy system. Yes, they created a, a local familiar restaurant for families, but you know, Ray Kroc was like, we've got this line that runs through Route sixty six here. Why can't we just do that from one one coast to the other? Um, and that's that's the. Uh, that's the ongoing debate between them throughout the whole movie. And I've got to say, this movie definitely deserves the five stars it got on, um, on Amazon. Um, mm. And, you know, uh, I was going to say, go and watch the film, but we've ruined the shit out of it right now. I mean, still watch it if you haven't watched it and you've listened to this podcast. But I do hope that you've actually gone and done the homework before you've listened to this podcast uh, and you appreciate what we've done here because we, I mean, Eric is very expertly, again, Taking us through clumsily. A movie expl- no, 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 no. We've done a great job, I think. You know, I, I watched this movie last week, listeners. Last week, and we put this amazing podcast together with all these great bits of um, artwork. You know, look at that. I mean, we've. I mean, look at those arches. You can't tell me those aren't. Um, they're a, they're pioneering in, in, in fast food and, and imagery. Ah, but it also, head. it's art. It is architecture. It is, it is culture. In its way, and it is something you know, and it is a thing that has impacted your life, and we really must give Dick McDonald and his brother Mac a bit of property here, as the film does, for correctly thinking that all of this was something that would work. The yellow arch is working. The use of red and yellow as a color scheme. All the googie architecture. I want the systems, the-, the food, the, the standards, the far-seeing things of all of this which points to an even greater thing that ray Kroc and the brothers and sonneborn all seem to hit on creativity is simply a matter of seeing something in your mind that others cannot and then rendering it in physical form somehow i want to know who the, the the big bald bastard was who stood in a board room meeting and went, yeah, you know the uh, the yellow and red and the green? Uh, we need to change to, like, brown and orange and, and, and green, uh, and we want wood everywhere. That's how we're going to do McDonald's now, because that's what all McDonald's looks like now. It's just these the earthy colours, you know, which is great and everything. But, you know, you don't look at a McDonald's restaurant the way they look now and go, ah, that's a McDonald's. I'm hungry. It's not striking. It doesn't like catch your eye. It's kind of like, yes, the logos do. But when you look at a McDonald's these days, they're very earthy, d- dull sort of colors, you know? Indeed. I'm quickly scrolling down to see at, at what point the golden arches were gradually phased out because they indeed were. Um, but the logo, as I said, is still there. That's not changed. Uh, in that sense, the arches are still there, even though the architecture, generally speaking, is now this sort of weird brick cubist hmm. nightmare of very garish color choices. But we talk about red and yellow stimulating food sales. Was that scientifically based or did Dick McDonald just decide aesthetically that red and yellow might work or indeed the architects decide that uh, strictly on their own as a creative inspiration and just that gradually became associated with food over time mm. as Ray Kroc predicted it would. Well, it's done him no harm. <laughs> Nobody's gone, oh my God, McDonald's are in deep trouble. They definitely need to make more money. Like, it's still pumping up. You know, what was it? I want, you know, was it they, they feed 1% of the whole world every single day, it says at the end of that film. Now, we now have to check what the global population is in order to get a sense of an actual number. But consider what that means. Um, An arch, God knows everywhere. The name McDonald's everywhere. And by the way, one last point that Ray seems to make, and I'm watching it on my monitor while doing it, is that he says, 
McDonald just sounds American. Slavic name like Croc. Nobody's going to go to a place called Crocs. The name matters. But then again, John Taffer could tell you that too. Um, Dick McDonald, the Taffer before Taffer. Next on Fast Food Rescue, the McDonald's brothers figure out pretty much everything you live with in the background radiation of your lives. Um, okay, so I've got I've got um, a world, it's a world population clock, and there's seven point eight eight five billion people on the planet. So, um, so one percent of that. Um, all about oh. that decimal. Um, okay, there we go. So a 1% yearly change, okay, it says here, yearly percent change is 1.05%, which equates to 81 million. 1% <laughs> is 81 million, right? That, that makes sense to me. So Each we... day, 81 Each day, million people are fed by this creation of these brothers and this guy and this other more real estate-minded guy every day across the globe. Insane. And well, it all comes that's... down to Dick McDonald having a creative brainstorm or 1,200 in his basement <laughs> or what have you, and then Ray Kroc seeing the potential in that, and then in uh, Sonneborn seeing the potential in that. Yeah. It's not just creativity the inspires anymore. creativity in others, and the result is that 81 billion sons of bitches are fed burgers every day. Fantastic, fantastic, isn't it? Small beginnings, we and did it's quite it, a did. thing to think about, uh, considering that uh, we had almost no prep, and it's um, not a movie that you'd necessarily think would appeal to an artist. Turns out, burger movie appeals to an artist. There was something I could play in this tuba. With a couple of like fart moments where the tuba just goes, <laughs> but I think but I did okay. He did a great job. Um, but Eric, before we get out of here, because I know we're running short. Well, I say we're running short on time. We've we've got plenty of time to do this. Um, I'd like to tell our listeners about a few things that's going on around you, so if that's okay with you, please. All right. Okay. So, guys, um, I will tell you about what I'm wearing in a second but first of all i'd like to tell you about a couple of other shows we have on our network and um, so you suck is a, a collection of, of three different shows of course there is this show yelling at clouds uh, which you are watching right now um if not then we got with real one. yelling with re <laughs> real yelling um <laughs> we also have wednesday night live which is a, a live um show that we do every wednesday uk time at 9 p.m or on the east coast that is by 4 p.m. 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, so this basically us coming together um, um, and catching up with each other, making sure we're okay, uh, having a bit of banter with the guys in the comments. It's a, it's a good thing. I mean, if you're ever around and you ever want to fancy just chiming in with the comments, you're more than welcome to. We'll have we'll have a fun with you. Um, we also have what's the difference podcast which is um a cultural show where me and my co-host tom bruno is in in vermont we take culture from the uk and the us sides of the atlantic and we say well, what what's the difference how do you how do you uh, sell music like uh, matt noveski here who is the bassist from blue october um that we did last week um and we, you can find everything that we do on our website which is uh, yousucknetwork.com and that website is made for us by our friends at Web Orchard. Uh, if you need a website making for anything, they will make a website that looks just as good as ours. If you don't believe us, go and check it out. Um, now, down to what I'm wearing, the important part of what, why, you know, Pod Aid is something that we came up with um, last year uh, during the pandemic. I, I wanted to do something nice for International Podcast Day, which is the 30th of September. And I missed it last year. So I was like, right, I need to do something. I need to plan something for this coming International Podcast Day. And I thought, let's do a 24-hour podcast. Now, I'm not a vain person. I really, I'm not. I want everything that I do to help people. So I needed a cause. A cause, why are we going to do this? Well, why don't we raise money for a local charity? Um, and the local charity we chose is Lingen Davis. You can see it right here at the bottom. 
in aid of Lincoln Davis. They're a cancer fund here in Shrewsbury. Now, I've done this because I want to encourage people that make podcasts, make uh, content um, to go out there and help their local communities. Um, and we've put this together. It's very ambitious, but we're doing it. Thanks to our main sponsors at Reach. Um, we are, they're running our marketing, our PR. They made these great logos that we've got right here. Look at that, you know. Uh, so on the 29th of September at 9 a.m., we're going to go live. Um, we're not going to stop for 24 hours. We're not going to stop till 9 a.m. UK time on the 30th of September. Um, we have our venue, thanks to Shrewsbury Town, the community. We're going to be used there, Reach Community Hub. Uh, we have our websites, obviously, thanks to Web Orchard and Reach are running the marketing and PR in the background. We have some great guests lined up. But what we need now is, is donations. Um, so if you want to sponsor an hour of this great event, uh, please get in touch with us via the website. Uh, there it is again, usucknetwork.com, or you can email us at usucklobal at gmail.com. We're selling sponsored hours for $140, which equates to £100. Uh, and for that hour, you'll get your logos um, brought up on the screen. And we'll be like, this hour is brought to you by such and such, you know, and we can play promotional videos and stuff. And you'll be helping a great charity too. So Pod Aid, it's going to be a great fun. I'm really looking forward to it. And you're going to be taking part too, Eric, aren't you? Oh, yeah. yeah. I am uh, facing off against the great uh, JC Reifenberg in a massive trivia smackdown contest in which I'm sure it'll actually be more like Another good natured debate again. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about uh, this and that and the, and the other uh, under moderation, I imagine. And yes, uh, under strict moderation because we've got an hour to do it. And I think uh, me and Tom Bruno and you as well, I think I mentioned to you, we were going to do like a presidential debate where we will give you a certain amount of time to talk about a certain amount of a certain subject. And then we'll let the listeners decide who win. I think that's a great idea. That's right. And and I look forward to it. I look forward to interacting with JC and seeing where this goes. At the very least, it should be fun. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So uh, what? Right, so, oh, go ahead. No, go, go for it. I was going to say, what do we do now? Should we just uh, should we, should we end the show? Maybe. Well, more or less, we could sum up things. What have we learned from this? Um, well, I can't decide whether to keep or get rid of McDonald's. It's going to be there whether I want it to be or not. Um, uh, have we learned something of value from the film? Well, we, I've, I've had it made clear to me just how much impact Dick McDonald had strictly in his own imagination by be, being able to make some creative leaps and now we have golden arches everywhere mm -hmm. we have a certain uh piece of art and architecture that everybody uh knows uh thanks to dick mcdonald and his architects uh stanley clark meston and if i'm remembering right charles fish uh that's one thing. We learned that this is a pretty decent film. It's Michael Corleone with a side order of fries, where a guy who's just tired of being a loser decides that being a winner means being an asshole. So he's going to be like that. Uh, he doesn't do anything about his voice, though. Um, <laughs> we So we've learned that this is actually a legit piece of art, and the fact that it's about burgers and or real estate or both doesn't change that. It's in the end about characters, motivations, and clashes. And that's pretty much it. What can I follow that up with next time? I guess we're going to talk about Sam Carvel, and we'll see me looking like an ice cream cake. So, because I really want to know the origin of Cookie Puss. <laughs> I think I think I've learned an awful lot just watching this film and then going over it with you. It was actually a nice little treat because after I watched this film, it was one of those films you watch and you think about afterwards. You're like, hmm, you know, I was drawn in regardless of you saying, oh, let's do the show about it. I was drawn in by Keaton's performance. But, you know, that kind of bumbling idiot to the I, I put a fucking hose in your mouth kind of thing, you know. But he's still doing it with the idiot's voice. Like, I'll fuck you up. I'll chainsaw you. Don't make me cap your ass. It's like a little That's tiny a... poodle barking. But there was That's bite in that bark. <laughs> By the way, we have strawberry now. Fuck you. <laughs> well, Eric, you've but... made me hungry, hungry now. You really have made me hungry. I'm starving. 
Totally. And that, oh, what can I say? I've got a big ch chicken sandwich in my fridge now too. So what can I say other than thank you, Alex, for allowing me to bumble my way through another episode of this. And now, uh, considering that I've made myself and you and presumably the audience utterly famished, I'm going to go grab a little bit of lunch. <laughs>